The Legends of King Arthur, Chapter 11 The Adventures of Sir Tristram of Lyonnais. Again, King Arthur held high festival at Carleon, at Pentecost, and gathered round him all the fellowship of the round table, and so, according to his custom, sat and waited till some adventure should arise, or some knight return to court, whose deeds and perils might be told. Anon he saw Sir Lancelot, and a crowd of knights coming through the doors, and leading in their midst the mighty knight Sir Tristram. As soon as King Arthur saw him, he rose up, and went through half the hall, and held out both his hands and cried, Right welcome to thee, good Sir Tristram, as welcome art thou as any knight that ever came before into this court. A long time have I wished for thee amongst my fellowship. Then all the knights and barons rose up with one accord, and came around, and cried out, Welcome! Queen Guinevere came also, and many ladies with her, and all with one voice said the same. Then the king took Sir Tristram by the hand, and led him to the round table, and said, Welcome again for one of the best and gentlest knights in all the world, a chief in war, a chief in peace, a chief in field and forest, a chief in the ladies' chamber. Right heartily welcome to this court, and mayest thou long abide in it. When he had so said, he looked at every empty seat until he came to what had been Sir Marhouse's, and there he found written in gold letters, This is the seat of the noble knight Sir Tristram. Whereat they made him, with great cheer and gladness, a fellow of the round table. Now the story of Sir Tristram was as follows. There was a king of Lyonnais called Meliodas, married to the sister of King Mark of Cornwall, a right fair lady and a good. And so it happened that King Meliodas, hunting in the woods, was taken by enchantment and made prisoner in a castle. When his wife Elizabeth heard it, she was nigh mad with grief, and ran into the forest to seek out her lord. But after many days of wandering and sorrow, she found no trace of him, and laid her down in a deep valley, and prayed to meet her death. And so indeed she did, but ere she died, she gave birth in the midst of all her sorrow to a child, a boy, and called him, with her latest breath, Tristram, for she said, his name shall show how sadly he hath come into this world. Therewith she gave up her ghost, and the gentlewoman who was with her took the child and wrapped it from the cold as well as she was able, and lay down with it in her arms beneath the shadow of a tree hard by, expecting death to come to her in turn. But shortly after came a company of lords and barons seeking for the queen, and found the lady and the child and took them home. And on the next day, came King Meliodas, whom Merlin had delivered, and when he heard of the Queen's death, his sorrow was greater than tongue can tell. And anon he buried her solemnly and nobly, and called the child Tristram, as she had desired. Then for seven years King Meliodas mourned and took no comfort, and all that time young Tristram was well nourished, but in a while he wedded with the daughter of Howell, King of Brittany, who, that her own children might enjoy the kingdom, cast about in her mind how she might destroy Tristram. So on a certain day she put poison in a silver cup where Tristram and her children were together playing, that when he was athirst he might drink of it and die. But so it happened that her own son saw the cup, and, thinking it must hold good drink, he climbed and took it, and drank deeply of it, and suddenly thereafter burst and fell down dead. When the queen heard that, her grief was very great, but her anger and envy were fiercer than before, and soon again she put more poison in the cup. And by chance one day, her husband, finding it when thirsty, took it up and was about to drink therefrom, when, seeing him, she sprang up with a mighty cry and dashed it from his hands. At that, King Meliodas, wondering greatly, called to mind the sudden death of his young child, and taking her fiercely by the hand, he cried, Traitress, tell me what drink is in this cup, or I will slay thee in a moment. And therewith pulling out his sword, he swore by a great oath to slay her, if she straightway told him not the truth. Ah, mercy, lord, said she, and fell down at his feet. Mercy, and I will tell thee all. And then she told him of her plot to murder Tristram, that her own sons might enjoy the kingdom. 
The law shall judge thee, said the king. And so anon she was tried before the barons and condemned to be burnt to death. But when the fire was made and she brought out, came Tristram kneeling at his father's feet and besought of him a favour. Whatsoever thou desirest I will give thee, said the king. Give me the life then of the queen, my stepmother, said he. Thou dost wrong to ask it, said Melodius, for she would have slain thee with her poisons if she could, and chiefly for thy sake she ought to die. Sir, said he, as for that I beseech thee of thy mercy to forgive it her, and for my part may God pardon her as I do, and so I pray thee, grant me my boon, and for God's sake hold thee to thy promise. If it must be so, said the king, take thou her life, for to thee I give it, and go and do with her as thou wilt. Then went young Tristram to the fire, and loosed the queen from all her bonds, and delivered her from death. And after a great while, by his good means, the king again forgave, and lived in peace with her, though never more in the same lodgings. Anon was Tristram sent abroad to France in care of one named Gouvernail, and there for seven years he learned the language of the land, and all knightly exercises and gentle crafts, and especially was he foremost in music and in hunting, and was a harper beyond all others. And when at nineteen years of age he came back to his father, he was as lusty and strong of body, and as noble of heart as ever man was seen. Now shortly after his return it befell that King Anguish of Ireland sent to King Mark of Cornwall for the tribute due to Ireland, but which was now seven years behind. To whom King Mark sent answer, if he would have it he must send and fight for it, and they would find a champion to fight against it. So King Anguish called for Sir Marhaus, his wife's brother, a good knight of the round table, who lived then at his court, and sent him with a knightly retinue in six great ships to Cornwall. And, casting anchor by the castle of Tintagil, he sent up daily to King Mark for the tribute of the champion. But no knight there would venture to assail him, for his fame was very high in all the realm for strength and hardihood. Then made King Mark a proclamation throughout Cornwall, that if any knight would fight Sir Marhaus, he should stand at the king's right hand for evermore, and have great honour and riches all the rest of his days. Anon this news came to the land of Lyoness, and when young Tristram heard it, he was angry and ashamed to think that no knight of Cornwall durst assail the Irish champion. Alas, said he, that I am not a knight, that I might match this Marhaus. I pray you, give me leave, sir, to depart to King Mark's court, and beg him of his grace to make me knight. Be ruled by thy own courage, said his father. So Tristram rode away forthwith to Tintagil, to King Mark, and went up boldly to him and said, Sir, give me the order of knighthood, and I will fight to the uttermost with Sir Marhaus of Ireland. What are ye, and whence come ye? said the king, seeing he was but a young man, though strong and well made, both in body and limb. My name is Tristram, said he, and I was born in the country of Lyoness. But know ye, said the king, the Irish knight will fight with none who be not come of royal blood, and near of king to kings and queens, as he himself is, for his sister is the queen of Ireland. Then said Tristram, let him know that I am come both on my father's and my mother's side of blood as good as his, for my father is King Meliodas, and my mother was that Queen Elizabeth, thy sister, who died in the forest at my birth. When King Mark heard that, he welcomed him with all his heart, and knighted him forthwith, and made him ready to go forth as soon as he would choose, and armed him royally in armour covered with gold and silver. Then he sent Sir Marhaus word that a better man than he could fight with him, Sir Tristram of Lyoness, son of King Meliodas and of King Mark's own sister. So the battle was ordained to be fought in an island near Sir Marhaus's ship, and there Sir Tristram landed on the morrow, with Gouvernail alone attending him for squire, and him he sent back to the land when he had made himself ready. When Sir Marhaus and Sir Tristram were thus left alone, Sir Marhaus said, Young knight, Sir Tristram, what dost thou hear? I am full sorry for thy rashness, for oft times I have been assailed in vain, and by the best knights of the world. Be warned in time, return to them that sent thee. 
Fair knight, and well-proved knight, replied Sir Tristram. Be sure that I shall never quit this quarrel till one of us be overcome. For this cause have I been made knight, and thou shalt know before we part that though as yet unproven, I am a king's son and first-born of a queen. Moreover, I have promised to deliver Cornwall from this ancient burden, or to die. Also, thou shouldest have known, Sir Marhaus, that thy valour and thy might are but the better reasons why I should assail thee. For whether I win or lose, I shall gain honour to have met so great a knight as thou art. Then they began the battle, and tilted at their hardest against each other, so that both knights and horses fell to the earth. But Sir Marhaus's spear smote Sir Tristram a great wound in the side. Then, springing up from their horses, they lashed together with their swords like two wild boars. And when they had stricken together, a great while they left off strokes and lunged at one another's breasts and visors. But seeing this availed not, they hurtled together again to bear each other down. Thus fought they more than half the day, till both were sorely spent, and blood ran from them to the ground on every side. But by this time Sir Tristram remained fresher than Sir Marhaus, and better winded, and with a mighty stroke he smote him such a buffet as cut through his helm into his brain-pan, and there his sword stuck in so fast that thrice Sir Tristram pulled ere he could get it from his head. Then fell Sir Marhaus down upon his knees, and the edge of Sir Tristram's sword broke off into his brain-pan. And suddenly, when he seemed dead, Sir Marhaus rose and threw his sword and shield away from him, and ran and fled into his ship. And Tristram cried out after him, Aha! Sir Knight of the Round Table, dost thou withdraw thee from so young a knight? It is a shame to thee and all thy kin. I would rather have been hewn into a hundred pieces than have fled from thee. But Sir Marhaus answered nothing, and sorely groaning fled away. Farewell, Sir Knight, farewell, laughed Tristram, whose own voice now was hoarse and faint with loss of blood. I have thy sword and shield in my safekeeping, and will wear them in all places where I ride on my adventures, and before King Arthur and the table round. Then Sir Marhaus was taken back to Ireland by his company, and as soon as he arrived his wounds were searched and when they searched his head, they found therein a piece of Tristram's sword, but all the skill of surgeons was in vain to move it out. So anon, Sir Marhaus died. But the queen, his sister, took the piece of sword blade and put it safely by, for she thought that some day it might help her to revenge her brother's death. Meanwhile, Sir Tristram, being sorely wounded, sat down softly on a little mound and bled passing fast and in that evil case was found anon by Governale and King Mark's knights. Then they gently took him up, and brought him in a barge back to the land, and lifted him into a bed within the castle, and had his wounds dressed carefully. But for a great while he lay sorely sick, and was likely to have died of the first stroke Sir Marhaus had given him with the spear, for the point of it was poisoned. And, though the wisest surgeons and leeches, both men and women, came from every part, yet could he be by no means cured. At last came a wise lady, and said plainly that Sir Tristram never should be healed, until he went and stayed in that same country whence the poison came. When this was understood, the king sent Sir Tristram in a fair and goodly ship to Ireland, and by fortune he arrived fast by a castle where the king and queen were. And as the ship was being anchored, he sat upon his bed, and harped a merry lay, and made so sweet a music as was never equalled. When the king heard that the sweet harper was a wounded knight, he sent for him and asked his name. I am of the country of Lioness, he answered, and my name is Tramtrist, for he dared not tell his true name, lest the vengeance of the queen should fall upon him for her brother's death. Well, said King Anguish, thou art right welcome here, and shalt have all the help this land can give thee. But be not anxious, if I am at times cast down and sad, for but lately in Cornwall, the best knight in the world, fighting for my cause, was slain. His name was Sir Marhaus, a knight of King Arthur's round table. And then he told Sir Tristram all the story of Sir Marhaus's battle, and Sir Tristram made pretense of great surprise and sorrow, though he knew all far better than the king himself. Then was he put in charge of the king's daughter, La Belle Isolt, to be healed of his wound, and she was as fair and noble a lady as men's eyes might see. 
and so marvellously was she skilled in medicine, that in a few days she fully cured him, and in return Sir Tristram taught her the harp, so, before long, they two began to love each other greatly. But at that time a heathen knight, Sir Palamedes, was in Ireland, and much cherished by the king and queen. He also loved mightily La Belle Isolt, and never wearied of making her great gifts, and seeking for her favour, and was ready even to be christened for her sake. Sir Tristram therefore hated him out of measure, and Sir Palamedes was full of rage and envy against Tristram. And so it befell that King Anguish proclaimed a great tournament to be held, the prize whereof should be a lady called the Lady of the Lawns, of near kindred to the king, and her the winner of the tournament should wed in three days afterwards and possess all her lands. When La Belle Isolt told Sir Tristram of this tournament, he said, Fair lady, I am yet a feeble knight, and but for thee had been a dead man now. What wouldst thou I should do? Thou knowest well I may not joust. Ah, Tristram, said she, why wilt thou not fight in this tournament? Sir Palamedes will be there, and will do his mightiest, and therefore be thou there, I pray thee, or else he will be winner of the prize. Madam, said Tristram, I will go, and for thy sake will do my best, but let me go unknown to all men, and do thou, I pray thee, keep my counsel, and help me to a disguise. So on the day of jousting came Sir Palamedes, with a black shield, and overthrew many knights, and all the people wondered at his prowess, for on the first day he put to the worst Sir Gawain, Sir Gaheris, Sir Agravain, Sir Kay, and many more from far and near, and on the morrow he was conqueror again, and overthrew the king with a hundred knights and the king of Scotland. But presently Sir Tristram rode up to the lists, having been let out at a pretty postern of the castle, where none could see. La Belle Isolt had dressed him in white armour, and given him a white horse and shield, and so he came suddenly into the field, as it had been a bright angel. As soon as Sir Palamedes saw him, he ran at him with a great spear in rest, but Sir Tristram was ready, and at the first encounter hurled him to the ground. Then there arose a great cry that the knight with the black shield was overthrown, and Palamedes, sorely hurt and shamed, sought out a secret way, and would have left the field, but Tristram watched him, and rode after him, and bade him stay, for he had not yet done with him. Then did Sir Palamedes turn with fury, and lash at Sir Tristram with his sword, but at the first stroke Sir Tristram smote him to the earth and cried, Do now all my commands, or take thy death. Then he yielded to Sir Tristram's mercy, and promised to forsake La Belle Isolt, and for twelve months to wear no arms or armour. And rising up, he cut his armour off him into shreds with rage and madness, and turned and left the field, and Sir Tristram also left the lists, and rode back to the castle through the postern gate. Then was Sir Tristram long cherished by the king and queen of Ireland, and ever with La Belle Isolt. But on a certain day, while he was bathing, came the queen with La Belle Isolt by chance into his chamber, and saw his sword lie naked on the bed. Anon she drew it from the scabbard, and looked at it a long while, and both thought it a passing fair sword. But within a foot and a half of the end there was a great piece broken out, and while the queen was looking at the gap, she suddenly remembered the piece of sword-blade that was found in the brain-pan of her brother, Sir Marhaus. Therewith she turned and cried, By my faith, this is the felon knight who slew thy uncle! And running to her chamber, she sought in her casket for the piece of iron from Sir Marhaus's head, and brought it back, and fitted it in Tristram's sword, and surely did it fit therein as closely as it had been but yesterday broke out. Then the queen caught the sword up fiercely in her hand, and ran into the room where Sir Tristram was yet in his bath, and making straight for him, had run him through the body, had not his squire, Sir Hebes, got her in his arms, and pulled the sword away from her. Then ran she to the king, and fell upon her knees before him, saying, Lord and husband, thou hast here in thy house that felon knight who slew my brother Marhaus. Who is it? said the king. It is Sir Tristram, said she, whom my salt hath healed. Alas, replied the king, I am full grieved thereat, for he is a good knight as ever I have seen in any field. But I charge thee leave thou him, and let me deal with him. Then the king went to Sir Tristram's chamber, and found him all armed and ready to mount his horse, and said to him, Sir Tristram, 
it is not to prove me against thee I come, for it were shameful of thy host to seek thy life. Depart in peace, but tell me first thy name, and whether thou slewest my brother, Sir Marhaus. Then Sir Tristram told him all the truth, and how he had hid his name to be unknown in Ireland, and when he had ended, the king declared he held him in no blame. Howbeit, I cannot for mine honour's sake retain thee at this court, for so I should displease my barons, and my wife, and all her kin. Sir, said Sir Tristram, I thank thee for the goodness thou hast shown me here, and for the great goodness my lady, thy daughter, hath shown me, and it may chance to be more for thy advantage, if I live than if I die, for wheresoever I may be, I shall ever seek thy service, and shall be my lady, thy daughter's servant, in all places, and her knight in right and wrong, and shall never fail to do for her as much as a knight can do. Then Sir Tristram went to La Belle Isolt, and took his leave of her. O oh, gentle knight, said she, full of grief am I at your departing, for never yet I saw a man to love so well. Madam, said he, I promise faithfully that all my life I shall be your knight. Then Sir Tristram gave her a ring, and she gave him another, and after that he left her, weeping and lamenting, and went among the barons, and openly took his leave of them all, saying, Fair lords, it so befalleth that I now must depart hence. Therefore, if there be any here whom I have offended, or who is grieved with me, let him now say it, and before I go I will amend it to the utmost of my power. And if there be but one who would speak shame of me behind my back, let him say it now or never, and here is my body to prove it on, body against body. And all stood still and said no word, though some there were of the Queen's kindred who would have assailed him had they dared. So Sir Tristram departed from Ireland and took the sea and came with a fair wind to Tintagel. And when the news came to King Mark that Sir Tristram was returned, healed of his wound, he was passing glad, and so were all his barons. And when he had visited the king, his uncle, he rode to his father, King Meliodas, and there had all the heartiest welcome that could be made him. And both the king and queen gave largely to him of their lands and goods. Anon he came again to King Mark's court, and there lived in great joy and pleasure, till, within a while, the king grew jealous of his fame, and of the love and favour shown him by all damsels. And as long as King Mark lived, he never after loved Sir Tristram, though there was much fair speech between them. Then it befell upon a certain day that the good knight Sir Bloberis de Ganis, brother of Sir Blamor de Ganis, and thy cousin to Sir Lancelot of the Lake, came to King Mark's court and asked him of a favour. And though the king marvelled, seeing he was a man of great renown and a knight of the round table, he granted him all his asking. Then said Sir Bloberis, I will have the fairest lady in your court, at my own choosing. I may not say thee nay, replied the king. Choose therefore, but take all the issues of thy choice. So, when he had looked around, he chose the wife of Earl Seguarides, and took her by the hand, and set her upon horseback behind his squire, and rode forth on his way. Presently thereafter, came in the earl, and rode out straight away after him in a rage. But all the ladies cried out shame upon Sir Tristram that he had not gone, and one rebuked him foully, and called him coward knight, that he would not stand and see a lady forced away from his uncle's court. But Sir Tristram answered her, Fair lady, it is not my place to take part in this quarrel while her lord and husband is here to do it. Had he not been at this court, peradventure, I had been her champion. And if it so befall that he speed ill, then may it happen that I speak with that foul knight before he pass out of the realm. Anon ran in one of Sir Seguarides' squires, and told that his master was sore wounded, and at the point of death. When Sir Tristram heard that, he was soon armed, and on his horse, and Governale his servant followed him with shield and spear. And as he rode, he met his cousin, Sir Andret, who had been commanded by King Mark to bring home to him two knights of King Arthur's court, who roamed the country whereabouts, seeking adventure. "'What tidings?' said Sir Tristram. "'God help me, never worse,' replied his cousin, 
for those I went to bring have beaten and defeated me, and set my message at naught. Fair cousin, said Sir Tristram, ride ye on your way, perchance if I should meet them, ye may be revenged. So Sir Andret rode into Cornwall, but Sir Tristram rode after the two knights who had misused him, namely Sir Sagramor le Desirous, and Sir Dodinas le Savage. And before long he saw them but a little way before him. Sir, said Gouvernail, by my advice thou wilt leave them alone, for they be two well-proved knights of Arthur's court. Shall I not therefore rather meet them? said Sir Tristram, and, riding swiftly after them, he called to them to stop, and asked them whence they came, and whither they were going, and what they were doing in those marches. Sir Sagramor looked haughtily at Sir Tristram, and made mocking of his words, and said, Fair knight, be ye a knight of Cornwall. Wherefore askest thou that? said Tristram. Truly, because it is full seldom seen, replied Sir Sagramor, that Cornish knights are valiant with their arms as with their tongues. It is but two hours since there met us such a Cornish knight, who spoke great words with might and prowess, but anon, with little mastery, he was laid on earth, as I trow wilt thou be also. Fair lords, said Sir Tristram, it may chance I be a better man than he, but, be that as it may, he was my cousin, and for his sake I will assail ye both, one Cornish knight against ye two. When Sir Dodinas Le Sauvage heard this speech, he caught at his spear and said, So knight, keep well thyself. And then they parted and came together as it had been thunder, and Sir Dodinas's spear split asunder, but Sir Tristram smote him with so full a stroke as hurled him over his horse's crupper and nearly brake his neck. Sir Sagramor, seeing his fellows fall, marvelled who this new knight might be, and dressed his spear, and came against Sir Tristram as a whirlwind, but Sir Tristram smote him a mighty buffet, and rolled him with his horse down on the ground, and in the falling he brake his thigh. Then, looking at them both as they lay grovelling on the grass, Sir Tristram said, Fair knights, will ye joust any more? Are there no bigger knights in King Arthur's court? Will ye soon again speak shame of Cornish knights? Thou hast defeated us in truth, replied Sir Sagramore, and on the faith of knighthood I require thee, tell us thy right name. Ye charge me by a great thing, said Sir Tristram, and I will answer ye. And when they heard his name, the two knights were right glad that they had met Sir Tristram, for his deeds were known through all the land, and they prayed him to abide in their company. Nay, said he, I must find a fellow knight of yours, Sir Bloberis de Ganis, whom I seek. God speed you well, said the two knights, and Sir Tristram rode away. Soon he saw before him in a valley Sir Bloberis, with Sir Segwarides' wife, riding behind his squire upon a palfrey. At that he cried aloud, Abide, Sir Knight of King Arthur's court, bring back again that lady, or deliver her to me. I will not, said Sir Bloberis, for I dread no Cornish knight. Why, said Sir Tristram, may not a Cornish knight do well as any other? This day, but three miles back, two knights of thy own court met me, and found one Cornish knight enough for both before we parted. What were their names? said Sir Bloberis. Sir Sagramor le Desirous, and Sir Dodinas le Sauvage, said Sir Tristram. Ah, said Sir Bloberis amazed, hast thou then met with them? By my faith they were two good knights and men of worship, and if thou hast beat both thou must needs be a good knight. But for all that thou shalt beat me, also ere thou hast this lady. Defend thee then, cried out Sir Tristram, and came upon him swiftly with his spear in rest. But Sir Bloberis was as swift as he, and each bore down the other, horse and all, onto the earth. Then they sprang clear of their horses, and lashed together full eagerly and mightily with their swords, tracing and traversing on the right hand and on the left more than two hours, and sometimes rushing together with such fury that they both lay grovelling on the ground. At last Sir Bloberis started back and said, Now, gentle knight, hold hard a while, and let us speak together. Say on, said Sir Tristram, and I will answer thee. Sir, said Sir Bloberis, I would know thy name, and court, and country. I have no shame to tell them, said Sir Tristram. I am King Meliodius's son, and my mother was sister to King Mark, from whose court I now come. 
My name is Sir Tristram de Lyoness. Truly, said Sir Bloberus, I am right glad to hear it, for thou art he that slew Sir Marhaus hand to hand, fighting for the Cornish tribute, and overcame Sir Palamedes at the great Irish tournament, where also thou didst overthrow Sir Gawain and his nine companions. I am that knight, said Sir Tristram, and now I pray thee tell me thy name. I am Sir Bloberus de Ganis, cousin of Sir Lancelot of the Lake, one of the best knights in all the world, he answered. Thou sayest truth, said Sir Tristram, for Sir Lancelot, as all men know, is peerless in courtesy and knighthood, and for the great love I bear to his name, I will not willingly fight more with thee his kinsman. In good faith, sir, said Sir Bloberus, I am as loth to fight thee more, but since thou hast followed me to win this lady, I proffer thee kindness, courtesy, and gentleness. This lady shall be free to go with which of us she pleaseth best. I am content, said Sir Tristram, for I doubt not she will come to me. That shalt thou shortly prove, said he, and called his squire, and set the lady in the midst between them, who forthwith walked to Sir Bloberis, and elected to abide with him, which, when Sir Tristram saw, he was in wondrous anger with her, and felt that he could scarce for shame return to King Mark's court. But Sir Bloberis said, Hearken to me, good knight, Sir Tristram, because King Mark gave me free choice of any gift, and because this lady chose to go with me, I took her, but now I have fulfilled my quest and my adventure, and for thy sake she shall be sent back to her husband at the abbey where he lieth. So Sir Tristram rode back to Tintagel, and Sir Bloberis to the abbey, where Sir Seguarides lay wounded, and there delivered up his lady, and departed as a noble knight. After this adventure, Sir Tristram abode still at his uncle's court, till in the envy of his heart King Mark devised a plan to be rid of him. So on a certain day he desired him to depart again for Ireland, and there demand La Belle Isolt on his behalf to be his queen, for ever had Sir Tristram praised her beauty and her goodness, till King Mark desired to wed her for himself. Moreover, he believed his nephew surely would be slain by the Queen's kindred if he once were found again in Ireland. But Sir Tristram, scorning fear, made ready to depart, and took with him the noblest knights that could be found, arrayed in the richest fashion. And when they were come to Ireland, upon a certain day, Sir Tristram gave his uncle's message, and King Anguish consented thereto. But when La Belle Isolt was told the tidings, she was very sorrowful and loth, yet made she ready to set forth with Sir Tristram, and took with her Dame Bragwain, her chief gentlewoman. Then the Queen gave Dame Bragwain and Gouvernail, Sir Tristram's servant, a little flask, and charged them that La Belle Isolt and King Mark should both drink of it on their marriage day, and then should they surely love each other all their lives. Anon Sir Tristram and Isolt, with a great company, took the sea and departed, and so it chanced that one day sitting in their cabin they were athirst, and saw a little flask of gold which seemed to hold good wine. So Sir Tristram took it up, and said, Fair lady, this looketh to be the best of wines, and your maid, Dame Bragwine, and my servant Gouvernail, have kept it for themselves. Thereat they both laughed merrily, and drank each after other from the flask, and never before had they tasted any wine which seemed so good and sweet. But by the time they had finished drinking, they loved each other so well that their love never more might leave them for weal or woe. And thus it came to pass, that though Sir Tristram might never wed La Belle Isolt, he did the mighty steeds of arms for her sake only, all his life. Then they sailed onwards till they came to a castle called Pluere, where they would have rested. But anon there ran forth a great company, and took them prisoners. And when they were in prison, Sir Tristram asked a knight and lady, whom they found therein, wherefore they were so shamefully dealt with. For, said he, it was never the custom of any place of honour that I ever came unto, to seize a knight and lady asking shelter, and thrust them into prison, and a full evil and discourteous custom is it. Sir, said the knight, know ye not that this is called the Castle Pluere, or the Weeping Castle, and that it is an ancient custom here, that whatsoever knight abideth in it, must needs fight the lord of it, Sir Brunor, and he that is the weakest shall lose his head and if the lady he hath with him be less fair than the lord's wife, she shall lose her head. 
but if she be fairer, then must the lady of the castle lose her head. Now heaven help me, said Sir Tristram, but this is a foul and shameful custom. Yet have I one advantage, for my lady is the fairest that doth live in all the world, so that I nothing fear for her, and as for me, I will full gladly fight for my own head in a fair field. Then said the knight, Look ye be up betimes to-morrow, and make you ready, and your lady. And on the morrow came Sir Brunor to Sir Tristram, and put him and Isolt forth out of prison, and brought him a horse and armour, and bade him make ready, for all the commons and estates of that lordship waited in the field to see and judge the battle. Then Sir Brunor, holding his lady by the hand, all muffled, came forth, and Sir Tristram went to meet him, with La Belle Isolt beside him, muffled also. Then said Sir Brunor, Sir Knight, if thy lady be fairer than mine, with thy sword smite off my lady's head. But if my lady be fairer than thine, with my sword I will smite off thy lady's head. And if I overcome thee, thy lady shall be mine, and thou shalt lose thy head. Sir Knight, replied Sir Tristram, this is a right foul and felon custom, and rather than my lady shall lose her head, will I lose my own. Nay, said Sir Brunor, but the ladies shall be now compared together, and judgment shall be had. I consent not, cried Sir Tristram, for who is here that will give rightful judgment? Yet doubt not that my lady is far fairer than thine own, and that will I prove and make good. Therewith Sir Tristram lifted up the veil from off La Belle Isolt, and stood beside her with his naked sword drawn in his hand. Then Sir Brunor unmuffled his lady, and did in the like manner. But when he saw La Belle Isolt, he knew that none could be so fair, and all their present gave their judgment so. Then said Sir Tristram, Because thou and thy lady have long used this evil custom, and have slain many good knights and ladies, it were a just thing to destroy thee both. In good sooth, said Sir Brunor, thy lady is fairer than mine, and of all women I never saw any so fair. Therefore, slay my lady if thou wilt, and I doubt not, but I shall slay thee and have thine. Thou shalt win her, said Sir Tristram, as dearly as ever knight won lady, and because of thy own judgment and of the evil custom that thy lady hath consented to, I will slay her as thou sayest. And therewithal Sir Tristram went to him, and took his lady from him, and smote off her head at a stroke. Now take thy horse, cried out Sir Brunor, for since I have lost my lady, I will win thine and have thy life. So they took to their horses, and came together as fast as they could fly, and Sir Tristram lightly smote Sir Brunor from his horse. But he rose right quickly, and when Sir Tristram came again, he thrust his horse through both the shoulders, so that it reeled and fell. But Sir Tristram was light and nimble, and voided his horse, and rose up and dressed his shield before him. Though meanwhile, ere he could draw out his sword, Sir Brunor gave him three or four grievous strokes. Then they rushed furiously together like two wild boars, and fought hurtling and hewing, here and there for nigh two hours, and wounded each other full sorely. Then at the last Sir Brunor rushed upon Sir Tristram, and took him in his arms to throw him, for he trusted greatly in his strength. But Sir Tristram was at that time called the strongest and biggest knight of the world, for he was bigger than Sir Lancelot, though Sir Lancelot was better breathed. So anon he thrust Sir Bruno grovelling to the earth, and then unlaced his helm and struck off his head. Then all they that belonged to the castle came and did him homage and fealty, and prayed him to abide there for a season and put an end to that foul custom. But within a while he departed and came to Cornwall, and there King Mark was forthwith wedded to La Belle Isolt with great joy and splendour. And Sir Tristram had high honour, and ever lodged at the king's court. But for all he had done him such services, King Mark hated him, and on a certain day he set two knights to fall upon him as he rode in the forest. But Sir Tristram lightly smote one's head off, and sorely wounded the other, and made him bear his fellow's body to the king. At that the king dissembled and hid from Sir Tristram that the knights were sent by him, yet more than ever he hated him in secret, and sought to slay him. So on a certain day, by the assent of Sir Andret, a false knight, and forty other knights, 
Sir Tristram was taken prisoner in his sleep and carried to a chapel on the rocks above the sea to be cast down. But as they were about to cast him in, suddenly he brake his bonds asunder and, rushing at Sir Andret, took his sword and smote him down therewith. Then, leaping down the rocks, where none could follow, he escaped them. But one shot after him and wounded him full sorely with a poisoned arrow in the arm. Anon, his servant Governale, with Sir Lambigus, sought him and found him safe among the rocks, and told him that King Mark had banished him and all his followers to avenge Sir Andret's death. So they took ship and came to Brittany. Now Sir Tristram, suffering great anguish from his wound, was told to seek Isoud, the daughter of the King of Brittany, for she alone could cure such wounds. Wherefore he went to King Howell's court and said, Lord, I am come into this country to have help from thy daughter, for men tell me none but she may help me. And I sued, gladly offering to do her best. Within a month he was made whole. While he abode still at that court, an earl named Grip made war upon King Howell and besieged him, and Sir Kay Hedius, the king's son, went forth against him, but was beaten in battle and sore wounded. Then the king, praying Sir Tristram for his help, he took with him such knights as he could, and on the morrow, in another battle, did such deeds of arms that all the land spake of him. For there he slew the earl with his own hands, and more than a hundred knights besides. When he came back, King Howell met him, and saluted him with every honour, and rejoicing that could be thought of, and took him in his arms, and said, Sir Tristram, all my kingdom will I resign to thee. Nay, answered he, God forbid, for truly am I beholden to you, for ever for your daughter's sake. Then the king prayed him to take Isoud in marriage, with a great dower of lands and castles. To this, Sir Tristram presently consenting, anon, they were wedded at the court. But within a while Sir Tristram greatly longed to see Cornwall, and Sir Kay Hedius desired to go with him. So they took ship, but as soon as they were at sea, the wind blew them upon the coast of North Wales, nigh to Castle Perilous, hard by a forest wherein were many strange adventures, oft times to be met. Then said Sir Tristram to Sir Kay Hedius, Let us prove some of them ere we depart. So they took their horses and rode forth. When they had ridden a mile or more, Sir Tristram spied a goodly knight before him, well armed, who sat by a clear fountain with a strong horse near him, tied to an oak tree. Fair sir, said he, when they came near, ye seem to be a knight errant by your arms and harness, therefore make ready now to joust with one of us, or both. Thereat the knight spake not, but took his shield and buckled it round his neck, and leaping on his horse caught a spear from his squire's hand. Then said Sir Kay Hedius to Sir Tristram, Let me essay him. Do thy best, said he. So the two knights met, and Sir Kay Hedius fell sorely wounded in the breast. Thou hast well jousted, cried Sir Tristram to the knight. Now make ready for me. I am ready, answered he, and encountered him, and smote him so heavily that he fell down from his horse. Whereat, being ashamed, he put his shield before him, and drew his sword, crying to the strange knight to do likewise. Then they fought on foot for well nigh two hours, till they were both weary. At last Sir Tristram said, In all my life I have never met a knight so strong and well-breathed as ye be. It were a pity we should further hurt each other. Hold thy hand, fair knight, and tell me thy name. That will I, answered he, if thou wilt tell me thine. My name, said he, is Sir Tristram of Lyoness, and mine, Sir Lamorac of Gaul. Then both cried out together, Well met! And Sir Lamorac said, Sir, for your great renown, I will that ye have all the worship of this battle, and therefore will I yield me unto you. And therewith he took his sword by the point to yield to him. Nay, said Sir Tristram, ye shall not do so, for well I know ye do it of courtesy and not of dread and therewith he offered his sword to Sir Lamorac, saying, Sir, as an overcome knight, I yield me unto you as unto the man of noblest powers I have ever met with. Hold, said Sir Lamorac, let us now swear together never more to fight against each other. Then did they swear, as he said. Then Sir Tristram returned to Sir Kay Hedius, and when he was whole of his wounds, they departed together in a ship, and landed on the coast of Cornwall. And when they came ashore, Sir Tristram eagerly sought news of La Belle Isolt. 
and one told him in mistake that she was dead. Whereat, for sore and grievous sorrow, he fell down in a swoon, and so lay there for three days and nights. When he awoke therefrom, he was crazed, and ran into the forest, and abode there like a wild man many days, whereby he waxed lean and weak of body, and would have died, but that a hermit laid some meat beside him as he slept. Now in that forest was a giant named Torlius, who, for fear of Tristram, had hid himself within a castle, but when they told him he was mad, came forth and went at large again. And on a certain day he saw a knight of Cornwall, named Sir Dinaunt, pass by with a lady, and when he had alighted by a well to rest, the giant leaped out from his ambush, and took him by the throat to slay him. But Sir Tristram, as he wandered through the forest, came upon them as they struggled, and when the knight cried out for help, he rushed upon the giant, and taking up Sir Dinaunt's sword, struck off therewith the giant's head, and straight away disappeared among the trees. Anon Sir Dinaunt took the head of Torlius, and bare it with him to the court of King Mark, whither he was bound, and told of his adventures. "'Where had ye this adventure?' said King Mark. "'At a fair fountain in thy forest,' answered he. "'I would fain see that wild man,' said the king. So within a day or two he commanded his knights to a great hunting in the forest, and when the king came to the well, he saw a wild man lying there asleep, having a sword beside him, but he knew not that it was Sir Tristram. Then he blew his horn, and summoned all his knights to take him gently up and bear him to the court. And when they came there too, they bathed and washed him, and brought him somewhat to his right mind. Now La Belle Isolt knew not that Sir Tristram was in Cornwall, but when she heard that a wild man had been found in the forest, she came to see him. And so sorely was he changed, she knew him not. Yet, said she to Dame Bragwain, in good faith I seem to have beheld him oft times before. As she thus spoke, a little hound, which Sir Tristram had given her when she first came to Cornwall, and which was ever with her, saw Sir Tristram lying there, and leapt upon him, licking his hands and face, and whined and barked for joy. Alas! cried out La Belle Isolt, it is my own true knight, Sir Tristram. And at her voice Sir Tristram's senses wholly came again, and well nigh he wept for joy to see his lady living. But never would the hound depart from Tristram, and when King Mark and other knights came up to see him, it sat upon his body and bayed at all who came too near. Then one of the knights said, Surely this is Sir Tristram, I see it by the hound. Nay, said the king, it cannot be, and asked Sir Tristram on his faith who he was. My name, said he, is Sir Tristram of Lyoness, and now ye may do what ye list with me. Then the king said, It repents me that ye are recovered, and sought to make his barons slay him. But most of them would not assent thereto, and counselled him instead to banish Tristram for ten years again from Cornwall, for returning without orders from the king. So he was sworn to depart forthwith. And as he went towards the ship, a knight of King Arthur, named Sir Dinadan, who sought him, came and said, Fair knight, ere that you pass out of this country, I pray you joust with me. With a good will, said he. Then they ran together, and Sir Tristram lightly smote him from his horse. Anon he prayed Sir Tristram's leave to bear him company, and when he had consented, they rode together to the ship. Then was Sir Tristram full of bitterness of heart, and said to all the knights who took him to the shore, Greet well, King Mark, and all mine enemies from me, and tell them I will come again when I may. Well am I now rewarded for slaying Sir Marhaus, and delivering this kingdom from its bondage, and for the perils wherewithal I brought La Belle Isolt from Ireland to the king, and rescued her at Castle Pluere, and for the slaying of the giant Torlius, and all the other deeds that I have done for Cornwall and King Mark. Thus angrily and passing bitterly he spake, and went his way. And after sailing a while, the ship stayed at a landing place upon the coast of Wales, and there Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadan alighted, and on the shore they met two knights, Sir Ector and Sir Bors, and Sir Ector encountered with Sir Dinadan, and smote him to the ground. But Sir Bors would not encounter with Sir Tristram. For, said he, no Cornish knights are men of worship. Thereat Sir Tristram was full wroth, but presently there met them two more knights, Sir Bloberis and Sir Driant, and Sir Bloberis offered to joust with Sir Tristram, who shortly smote him down. I had not thought, cried out Sir Bors, that any Cornish knight could do so valiantly. 
Then Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadan departed, and rode into a forest, and as they rode a damsel met them, who for Sir Lancelot's sake was seeking any noble knights to rescue him. For Queen Morgan le Fay, who hated him, had ordered thirty men-at-arms to lie in ambush for him as he passed, with the intent to kill him. So the damsel prayed them to rescue him. Then said Sir Tristram, Bring me to that place, fair damsel. But Sir Dinadan cried out, It is not possible for us to meet with thirty knights. I will take no part in such a hardihood, for to match one or two or three knights is enough, but to match fifteen I will never assay. For shame, replied Sir Tristram, do but your part. That will I not, said he, wherefore I pray ye lend me your shield, for it is of Cornwall, and because men of that country are deemed cowards, ye are but little troubled as ye ride with knights to joust with. Nay, said Sir Tristram, I will never give my shield up for her sake who gave it me, but if thou wilt not stand by me today, I will surely slay thee, for I ask no more of thee than to fight one knight, and if thy heart will not serve thee that much, thou shalt stand by and look on me and them. Would God that I had never met with ye, cried Sir Dinadan, but I promise to look on and do all that I may to save myself. Anon they came to where the thirty knights lay waiting, and Sir Tristram rushed upon them, saying, Here is one who fights for the love of Lancelot. Then slew he two of them at the first onset with his spear, and ten more swiftly after with his sword. At that Sir Dinadan took courage and assailed the others with him, till they turned and fled. But Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadan rode on till nightfall, and meeting with a shepherd, asked him if he knew of any lodgings thereabouts. Truly, fair lords, said he, there is good lodging in a castle hard by, but it is a custom there that none shall lodge therein, save ye first joust with two knights, and as soon as ye be within, ye shall find your match. That is an evil lodging, said Sir Dinadan. Lodge where ye will, I will not lodge there. Shame on thee, said Sir Tristram. Art thou a knight at all? Then he required him on his knighthood to go with him, and they rode together to the castle. As soon as they were near, two knights came out and ran full speed against them, but both of them they overthrew, and went within the castle, and had noble cheer. Now, when they were unarmed and ready to take rest, there came to the castle gates two knights, Sir Palamedes and Sir Gaheris, and desired the custom of the castle. I would far rather rest than fight, said Sir Dinadan. That may not be, replied Sir Tristram, for we must needs defend the custom of the castle, seeing we have overcome its lords. Therefore make ready. Alas that I ever came into your company, said Sir Dinadan. So they made ready, and Sir Gaheris encountered Sir Tristram, and fell before him. But Sir Palamedes overthrew Sir Dinadan. Then would all fight on foot save Sir Dinadan, for he was sorely bruised and frightened by his fall. And when Sir Tristram prayed him to fight, I will not, answered he, for I was wounded by those thirty knights with whom we fought this morning. And as to you, ye are in truth like one gone mad, and who would cast himself away. There be but two knights in the world so mad, and the other is Sir Lancelot, with whom I once rode forth, who kept me evermore at battling, so that for a quarter of a year thereafter I lay in my bed. Heaven defend me again from either of your fellowships. Well, said Sir Tristram, if it must be, I will fight them both. Therewith he drew his sword, and assailed Sir Palamedes and Sir Gerharis together. But Sir Palamedes said, Nay, but it is a shame for two to fight with one. So he bade Sir Gerharis stand by, and he and Sir Tristram fought long together. But in the end Sir Tristram drave him backwards, whereat Sir Gaheris and Sir Dinadan with one accord sundered them. Then Sir Tristram prayed the two knights to lodge there, but Sir Dinadan departed and rode away into a priory hard by, and there he lodged that night. And on the morrow came Sir Tristram to the priory to find him, and seeing him so weary that he could not ride, he left him and departed. At that same priory was lodged Sir Pellinore, who asked Sir Dinadan Sir Tristram's name, but could not learn it, for Sir Tristram had charged that he should remain unknown. Then said Sir Pellinore, Since ye will not tell it to me, I will ride after him and find it myself. Beware, Sir Knight, said Sir Dinadan, ye will repent it if ye follow him. But Sir Pellinore straight away mounted and overtook him, and cried to him to joust, whereat Sir Tristram forthwith turned and smote him down, and wounded him full sorely in the shoulder. 
On the day after, Sir Tristram met a herald, who told him of a tournament proclaimed between King Carados of Scotland and the King of North Wales, to be held at the Maiden's Castle. Now King Carados sought Sir Lancelot to fight there on his side, and the King of North Wales sought Sir Tristram, and Sir Tristram purposed to be there. So as he rode, he met Sir Kay, the Seneschal, and Sir Sagramor, and Sir Kay proffered to joust with him. But he refused, desiring to keep himself unwearied for the tourney. Then Sir Kay cried, Sir Knight of Cornwall, joust with me, or yield as a recreant. When Sir Tristram heard that, he fiercely turned and set his spear in rest, and spurred his horse towards him. But when Sir Kay saw him so madly coming on, he in his turn refused, whereat Sir Tristram called him coward, till for shame he was compelled to meet him. Then Sir Tristram lightly smote him down, and rode away. But Sir Sagramor pursued him, crying loudly to joust with him also. So Sir Tristram turned and quickly overthrew him likewise, and departed. Anon a damsel met him as he rode, and told him of a knight adventurous who did great harm thereby, and prayed him for his help. But as he went with her, he met Sir Gawain, who knew the damsel for a maiden of Queen Morgan le Fay. Knowing, therefore, that she needs must have evil plots against Sir Tristram, Sir Gawain demanded of him courteously whither he went. I know not whither, said he, save as this damsel leadeth me. Sir, said Sir Gawain, ye shall not ride with her, for she and her lady never yet did good to any. And drawing his sword, he said to the damsel, Tell me now straight away for what cause thou leadest this knight, or else shalt thou die, for I know of old thy lady's treason. Mercy, Sir Gawain, cried the damsel, and I will tell thee all. Then she told him that Queen Morgan had ordained thirty fair damsels to seek out Sir Lancelot and Sir Tristram, and by their wiles persuade them to her castle, where she had thirty knights in wait to slay them. O oh, shame! cried Sir Gawain, that ever such foul treason should be wrought by a queen and a king's sister. Then said he to Sir Tristram, Sir Knight, if ye will stand with me, we will together prove the malice of these thirty knights. I will not fail you, answered he, for but few days since I had to do with thirty knights of that same queen, and trust we may win honour as likely now as then. So they rode together, and when they came to the castle, Sir Gawain cried aloud, Queen Morgan le Fay! "'Send out thy knights, that we may fight with them.' "'Then the queen urged her knights to issue forth, "'but they durst not, for they well knew Sir Tristram, "'and feared him greatly. "'So Sir Tristram and Sir Gawain went on their way, "'and as they rode they saw a knight, "'named Sir Bruce without pity, "'chasing a lady with intent to slay her. "'Then Sir Gawain prayed Sir Tristram to hold still "'and let him assail that knight. "'So he rode up between Sir Bruce and the lady and cried, "'False knight!' "'Turn thee to me, and leave that lady!' "'Then Sir Bruce turned, and set his spear in rest, "'and rushed against Sir Gawain, and overthrew him, "'and rode his horse upon him as he lay, "'which when Sir Tristram saw, he cried, "'Forbear that villainy!' and galloped at him. "'But when Sir Bruce saw by the shield it was Sir Tristram, "'he turned and fled. "'And though Sir Tristram followed swiftly after him, "'yet he was so well horsed that he escaped. "'Anon, Sir Tristram and Sir Gawain came nigh the maiden's castle, and there an old knight named Sir Pelines gave them lodging. And Sir Persides, the son of Sir Pelines, a good knight, came out to welcome them. And, as they stood talking at a bay window of the castle, they saw a goodly knight ride by on a black horse and carrying a black shield. "'What knight is that?' asked Tristram. "'One of the best knights in all the world,' said Sir Persides. "'Is he Sir Lancelot?' said Sir Tristram. "'Nay,' answered Sir Persides. "'It is Sir Palamedes, who is yet unchristened.' Within a while one came and told them that a knight with a black shield had smitten down thirteen knights. "'Let us go and see this jousting,' said Sir Tristram. So they armed themselves and went down. And when Sir Palamedes saw Perisides, he sent a squire to him and proffered him to joust. So they jousted, and Sir Perisides was overthrown. Then Sir Tristram made ready to joust, but ere he had his spear in rest, Sir Palamedes took him at advantage, and struck him on the shield so that he fell. At that Sir Tristram was wroth out of measure, and sore shamed, whereon he sent a squire and prayed Sir Palamedes to joust once again. But he would not, saying, 
Tell thy master to revenge himself to-morrow at the maiden's castle, where he shall see me again. So on the morrow Sir Tristram commanded his servant to give him a black shield, with no cognizance thereon, and he and Sir Perisides rode into the tournament and joined King Carados's side. Then the knights of the King of North Wales came forth, and there was a great fighting and breaking of spears, and overthrow of men and horses. Now King Arthur sat above in a high gallery to see the tourney and give the judgment, and Sir Lancelot sat beside him. Then came against Sir Tristram and Sir Perisides two knights with them of North Wales, Sir Bloberis and Sir Gerharis, and Sir Persides was smitten down and nigh slain, for four horsemen rode over him. But Sir Tristram rode against Sir Gerharis and smote him from his horse, and when Sir Bloberis next encountered him, he overthrew him also. Anon they horsed themselves again, and with them came Sir Dinadan, whom Sir Tristram forthwith smote so sorely that he reeled off his saddle. Then he cried, Ah, Sir Knight, I know ye better than ye deem, and promise never more to come against ye. Then rode Sir Bloberis at him the second time, and had a buffet that felled him to the earth, and soon thereafter the king commanded to cease for that day, and all men marvelled who Sir Tristram was, for the prize of the first day was given him in the name of the Knight of the Black Shield. Now Sir Palamedes was on the side of the King of North Wales, but knew not Sir Tristram again, and when he saw his marvellous deeds, he sent to ask his name. As to that, said Sir Tristram, he shall not know at this time, but tell him he shall know when I have broken two spears upon him, for I am the knight he smote down yesterday, and whatever side he taketh, I will take another. So when they told him that Sir Palamedes would be on King Carados's side, for he was kindred to King Arthur, then will I be on the King of North Wales's side, said he, but else would I be on my Lord King Arthur's. Then on the morrow, when King Arthur was come, the heralds blew unto the tawny, and King Carados jousted with the King of a hundred knights and fell before him, and then came in King Arthur's knights, and bare back those of North Wales. But anon Sir Tristram came to aid them, and bare back the battle, and fought so mightily that none could stand against him, for he smote down on the right and on the left, so that all knights and common people shouted his praise. "'Since I bear arms,' said King Arthur, "'never saw I a knight do more marvellous deeds.' Then the king of the hundred knights and those of North Wales set upon twenty knights who were of Sir Launcelot's king, who fought all together, none failing the others. When Sir Tristram beheld their nobleness and valour, he marvelled much. Well may he be valiant and full of prowess, said he, who hath such noble knights for kindred. So, when he had looked on them a while, he thought it shame to see two hundred men assailing twenty, and riding to the king of a hundred knights, he said, I pray thee, Sir King, leave your fighting with those twenty knights, for ye be too many, and they be too few. For ye shall gain no honour if ye win, and that I see verily ye will not do unless ye slay them. But if ye will not stay, I will ride with them and help them. Nay, said the King, ye shall not do so, for full gladly I will do you courtesy. And with that he withdrew his knights. Then Sir Tristram rode his way into the forest, that no man might know him, and King Arthur caused the heralds to blow that the tourney should end that day, and he gave the King of North Wales the prize, because Sir Tristram was on his side. And in all the field there was such a cry that the sound thereof was heard two miles away. The knight with the black shield hath won the field! Alas, said King Arthur, where is that knight? It is shame to let him thus escape us. Then he comforted his knights, and said, Be not dismayed, my friends, howbeit ye have lost the day. Be of good cheer. Tomorrow I myself will be in the field, and fare with you. So they all rested that night. And on the morrow the heralds blew unto the field. So the king of North Wales and the king of a hundred knights encountered with King Carados and the king of Ireland, and overthrew them. With that came King Arthur, and did mighty deeds of arms, and overthrew the king of North Wales and his fellows, and put twenty valiant knights to the worse. Anon came in Sir Palamedes, and made great fight upon King Arthur's side. But Sir Tristram rode furiously against him, and Sir Palamedes was thrown from his horse. Then cried King Arthur, Knight of the Black Shield, keep thyself! 
And as he spake, he came upon him, and smote him from his saddle to the ground, and so passed on to the other knights. Then Sir Palamedes, having now another horse, rushed at Sir Tristram, as he was on foot, thinking to run over him. But he was aware of him, and stepped aside, and grasped Sir Palamedes by the arms, and pulled him off his horse. Then they rushed together with their swords, and many stood still to gaze on them. And Sir Tristram smote Sir Palamedes with three mighty strokes upon the helm, crying at each stroke, Take this for Sir Tristram's sake! And with that Sir Palamedes fell to earth. Anon the king of North Wales brought Sir Tristram another horse, and Sir Palamedes found one also. Then did they joust again with passing rage, for both by now were like mad lions. But Sir Tristram avoided his spear, and seized Sir Palamedes by the neck, and pulled him from his saddle, and bore him onward ten spears' length, and so let him fall. Then King Arthur drew forth his sword, and smote the spear asunder, and gave Sir Tristram two or three sore strokes, ere he could get at his own sword. But when he had it in his hand he mightily assailed the king. With that eleven knights of Lancelot's kin went forth against him, but he smote them all down to the earth, so that men marvelled at his deeds. And the cry was now so great that Sir Lancelot got a spear in his hand, and came down to assay Sir Tristram, saying, Knight with the black shield, make ready! When Sir Tristram heard him, he levelled his spear, and both stooping their heads, they ran together mightily, as it had been thunder. And Sir Tristram's spear brake short, but Sir Lancelot struck him with a deep wound in the side and broke his spear, yet overthrew him not. Therewith Sir Tristram, smarting at his wound, drew forth his sword, and rushing at Sir Lancelot, gave him mighty strokes upon the helm, so that the sparks flew from it, and Sir Lancelot stooped his head down to the saddle-bow. But then Sir Tristram turned and left the field, for he felt his wound so grievous that he deemed he should soon die. Then did Sir Lancelot hold the field against all comers, and put the King of North Wales and his party to the worse. And because he was the last knight in the field, the prize was given him. But he refused to take it, and when the cry was raised, Sir Lancelot hath won the day, he cried out, Nay, but Sir Tristram is the victor, for he first began, and last endured, and so hath he done each day. And all men honoured Lancelot more for his knightly words than if he had taken the prize. Thus was the tournament ended, and King Arthur departed to Carleon, for the Whitsun feast was now nigh come, and all the knights adventurous went their ways. And many sought Sir Tristram in the forest, whither he had gone, and at last Sir Lancelot found him, and brought him to King Arthur's court, as hath been told already.